so thank you so much. Um, I want to, um, you know, talk about this book and I would be, re be remiss if I didn't talk about the fact that I was able to complete this book here um, in, in East Lansing, Michigan, which is in the state of Michigan, which is on the um, ancestral and traditional lands of the Three Fires Confederacy, um, the Odawa, the Potawatomi, and the Ojibwe peoples. Michigan State University is um, not only, um, was not only built on indigenous encampments, um, but it is also one of, it is the first land grant uh, university in the country, something that it uh, kind of talks about in louds um, when, you know, they're talking about the importance of this place. But for me, that is synonymous with a particular form of foundational violence. Um, and so it's always been important for me to kind of foreground um, the privileges that we have in the place, the places where we complete our work. I am going to um, talk a little bit more about the crossings and talking a little bit about more about these relations. But one of the things that I like to begin with is talking a little bit about myself, situating myself within this kind of like intellectual journey and this project. I am a native of Puerto Rico, born and raised in Hoboken, New Jersey. My parents are from uh, Vega Baja and from Caguas, Puerto Rico, and I'm a first generation high school and college graduate. Uh, the first person in my family, I mean, my sister, are the first two people um, to graduate from high school, and I'm the first one to go on and to go to college. I went to undergrad at Rutgers University, where I majored in English, literature, uh, Puerto Rican and Hispanic Caribbean studies, and women's and gender studies. Um, I went from there to uh, pursue a PhD um, at the Comparative Ethnic Studies program at UC Berkeley, and it was really an incredible experience where I was able to bring together my interest in literature with the kind of social scientific approach that brought together questions of like feminism, geography, sociology, history, etc., philosophy, right? And so that's um, been, uh, it was a kind of a serendipitous moment for me to be able to go to those places and to, and to do this study there. And, and it's really where I began to expand what I wanted to do and what I wanted to think about, which was particularly Puerto Rico. And so if you've seen the book and what you're gonna hear about the talk, you'll see that Puerto Rico kind of appears in the text, but the text is not necessarily about that place. Um, and so literally that, that kind of move across the country to graduate school expanded my horizons of, of what I wanted to do. Um, I have these photos here of my parents and, and I kind of put this here because I think it's important to kind of think about the legacies that we bring with us wherever we go and the kinds of like intellectual genealogy. My father studied until the third grade, my mother studied until the eighth grade um, and they were kind of autodidacts and my father loved reading and so did my mother. And so they really instilled in us this love of, of literature, of writing of the word. And so this is a photo of me and my father at my first grade graduation, which was a huge deal for them. Um, and then me and my mother at my PhD graduation, uh, which she was able to, and my father had passed away by then. Um, and so, yes, and so I'm an associate professor now at Michigan State University and I just got tenure, so yay me. Um, and, and didn't get here alone and I'm glad for that. <laughs> okay, so one of the things that I want us to start with and I want us to think about um, at this moment is thinking about the crossings. And I want us to take a second to think about who we wanna be in relationship with. What is our work in our life in relationship to? And for me, the work of M. Jackie Alexander is so important in thinking about this. Um, in her book, uh, Pedagogies of Crossing, she says, this then is the existential message of the crossing to appreh apprehend how it might instruct us in the urgent task of configuring new ways of being and knowing and to plot the different metaphysics that are needed to move away from living alterity, premise and difference to living intersubjectivity, premise in relationality and solidarity. And so I just want us to take a few seconds, maybe 10 seconds, to think about who you want to bring with you um, today in this moment, who you want to be in relationship to um, as we go through this talk and then the kind of conversation afterwards. Thank you. So this book that I'll be talking about, Decon and Dinastros, oh, the poster's here. <laughs> I try to like whip it out whenever I can. It's just like gathering dust in my house. Um, so Decon and Diaspora's Radical Mappings of Afro-Atlantic Literature examines the literature and the cultural productions emerging out of the Spanish-speaking Caribbean or the Hispanic Caribbean, uh, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, particularly looking at the Afro, Cuban, Afro-Puerto Rican, Afro-Dominican literary and culture experience in the diaspora, right? So it's kind of like displaced uh, migration, right? Um, in relationship to the literature, culture, cultural productions, et cetera, of Equatorial Guinea, which is the only Spanish speaking country in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and particularly the, the, the cultural productions, the literature, et cetera, are being produced 
the majority of them have been produced in exile and in diaspora in Spain. And so what I'm really looking um, to do in this book and what, and what I've kind of mapped together through this is really thinking through questions of, of uh, relationality, tracing the long historical relationship between the Spanish-speaking Caribbean and Spanish-speaking Africa, what is now Equatorial Guinea, what used to be Spanish Guinea, um, and then building from those long histories of relationality under the colonial heel of Spain. So then looking at the ways that contemporarily their imaginations, their literatures, their cultures, their arts, aesthetics um, are able to um, bring to the fore particular forms of not only uh, histories that are often undertold, um, but also thinking through um, uh, a kind of uh, what I call an archive of indictment, right? Really speaking back to uh, long histories um, of oppression, dictatorship, colonialism, fascism, um, but then also at the same time looking at resistance. And so in the book, I look at you know poetry, literature, music, short stories, et cetera, and including visual art to look at the ways that they engage in this other way of seeing, right? And one of the ways that I talk about these places, um, uh, these, these four different populations, these particular kinds of places and words are as peripheralized works. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is. And so here, what you'll see is a kind of up close map. The kind of map that we're more used to seeing is the one of the Caribbean, where the kind of three Spanish speaking islands are often like very prominent. They're the largest islands in the Caribbean. Um, and then on the other side, we see Equatorial Guinea. It's a small continental swath between Cameroon and Gabon. Um, it, it represents this little, it's this little piece of the continent, and then it's five islands, right? One of the islands is all the way at the bottom. It's kind of the farthest away, it's called Anabon. Um, and then the kind of major island on top um, is called Bioko. And that is kind of like the seat of power, the central kind of locus of power in the nation state. And one of the reasons that I that I kind of use this this uh, phrasing of the periphery um, is because I'm building on the work of Dominican scholars Silvio Torresaña and Ramon Hernandez, where in their book The Dominican Americans they argue that if if Latinx folks or Latinos are marginal, then Dominicans are peripheral to that margin. And while I think that that has changed to some extent with the kind of robust incredible work happening in transnational Dominican studies, I still think that it is kind of like an apt way to think about who gets left out of certain kinds of conversations. In, uh, uh, in the context of Equatorial Guinea, one of the things that needs to be considered is the way that their literature, because it is produced in Spanish and also mostly in exile and diaspora due to the dictatorship, means that it doesn't often get talked about within the African like literary canon, right? Um, also, just because it's produced in Spain doesn't mean that it falls into um, the kind of Spanish letters, right? Or the Spanish canon of literature. Um, and so in that way, it falls outside of so many of the established discourses. In the case of the uh, Afro-Latinx uh, literature and culture and thinking about the Caribbean, one of the things that we see is that not only is Blackness um, as such a vexed topic with, within Latinx studies, but that oftentimes within the US like markets and logics, it's particularly publishing logics, um, they usually can only be like one <laughs> Latinx author of the moment, right? And so there's a way in which uh, uh, folks not only fall out within the region itself, but also outside of the region within the USCN context, um, fall out of that uh, of that kind of um, popularity in the market. So it really is, we have this entire beautiful body of literature that often doesn't get talked about. Not only that, but one of the things that becomes really important for us to think about, and one of the things that I was wrestling with in the book was thinking about the ways that so many of our established fields and even disciplines, um, oftentimes uh, the, these two areas kind of fall in the gaps, right? Um, so I can think about the ways that Afro-Latinx studies is something that is now being more talked about, it's seeing much more visibility in Latinx studies, something that wasn't really happening for a long time. But in Black studies, the kind of um, uh, emphasis on the Anglo world, the English speaking world, means that uh, Afro-Latinx studies or these like linguistically other Black people um, have to find ways to get into the conversation, right? Um, similarly, um, on the side of Equatorial Guinea, they're not necessarily talked about in African studies or Black studies. They are often discussed in two areas, which is Hispanophone studies and also linguistics, right? Um, but even in doing that, um, it is usually thought about as like the kind of legacies of colonialism and extension of you know Spanish democracy, et cetera, et cetera, not really taking up how they think about themselves. And so for me, really thinking about what it means to be on the periphery of the margin and what does it mean to kind of put together, to link together these Afro-Atlantic, these Black Atlantic subjects 
um, and to have them illuminate for us really important questions that can help guide us in our own quest for liberation. So in this map here, um, which um, one of my amazing graduate students, Angelica de Jesus, made for me because I failed miserably at being able to create this <laughs> um, on the um, on the software. Um, this kind of shows the kind of long expanse of the places that I am looking to, right? And, and, I, and I am speaking about and um, through both a kind of personal experience, but also taking seriously um, the, their work and the ways that their literature, particularly in the case of, for example, Equatorial Guinea, where so much of the fiction is actually history written as fiction, right? Under the duress of, um, of the dictatorship. And so what this shows is kind of expanse of the, of the Atlantic. And um, there's obviously such incredible and rich work thinking about the Black Atlantic. And one of the reasons that I deploy the use of Afro-Atlantic in this is because I wanted to pay attention to the kind of linguistic shifts, right? The kind of ways that thinking through um, something like the Black Atlantic le uh, lends itself to, uh, to us thinking about this through Anglo or English terms. Thinking through Afro-Atlantic or Afro-Atlantic or Afro-Descendiente, right? Um, Africano helps us um, think through these other kind of linguistic vectors and opens up a space for me um, to, uh, to uh, pay attention to the way that people articulate their own identities and their own experiences without me imposing from a US or English standpoint what that means, right? Um, one of the things that I found really interesting about this project and one of the things I'm so excited for is this kind of like archipelagic turn in Latinx studies. For me, I come to, you know, archipelagic studies through thinking of, you know, Pacific world, particularly like indigenous Pacific Islander um, and Oceania uh, studies. Um, and one of the, um, in a, a very beautiful moment, uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore suggested this book for me um, as I was talking to her about my project many years ago. And um, when I got the book, I opened it and I realized how incredible it was um, in this map here for us to think about geographies and visualities differently. Um, and this map here is from a book called New York Nonstop Metropolis, which has a series of different maps and cartographies of New York City kind of um, imagined from different ways and thinking through different kinds of data points. In this map, what you see is the islands of the Caribbean put together with the islands of New York City, right? In this way, for me, it's a visual rendering of the huge Caribbean migration to New York City and also even beyond that to other kinds of um, cities and places in the quote unquote mainland United States. Um, and then really shifting that idea of the mainland United States by, by like showing us and rendering these islands for us to see. Um, not only this, but also this put into like a visual scope for me, the kinds of one of the central tenets of Latinx studies, right, US Latinx studies, which is that New York City and, and Miami and Chicago and places beyond are extensions of the Caribbean, right? Because there's such a large number of these populations. And for example, there's more Puerto Ricans now living in the US than in Puerto Rico. Right. Um, and so really kind of shifting those geographies and to kind of use the words of the Caribbean Philosophical Association, shifting the geography of reason. Right. And so one of the things that I had to be really careful with in putting together this book was thinking through differences. And I, and I started talking at the beginning through Jackie Alexander's understanding of the crossings and of relations and of solidarity and what that means at the same time that this book was really interested in the lived experience of Black people, right? However, I knew that language is a slippery and, and tricky thing. And that when I am talking in these particular cases, one in Sub-Saharan Africa, and then I have, you know, these islands and the diasporas from the Spanish-speaking Caribbean, that I had to be very attuned to difference, right? And so I created this kind of um, relational cartography for myself called the Critical Cartography of Racialization. And I argue that it helps us to hold space for the different ways that anti-Blackness and the colonial difference in viewed former colonies and contemporary metropoles. This relational cartography of racialization for Afro-diasporic peoples outlines the unfixed racial, ethnic, ontological, and phenomenological experiences that emerge when moving across spatial and temporal locales. To be clear, one of the things that I needed to be careful with, particularly in the case of Equatorial Guinea, was the fact that the ethnic differences within the nation state were really important and they mattered, particularly if I was looking at the arts, their critiques of power, um, and their particular kinds of engagement um, with systems of oppression and resistance. And not only that, but that within uh, Equatorial Guinea, although the, the lingua franca is Spanish, folks are speaking their indigenous languages and are, are striving and, um, and attempting to um, give flowers to, to protect, right, their indigenous cultures and languages. 
Um, and that a lot of this is mediated through particular kinds of uh, intra-ethnic power struggles. And so when I'm talking about Equatorial Guinea, I had to pay attention to whether the writer was Fang, Anobones, and the way, Bujeba from Corisco, the Playeros, right? Um, and I had to be careful with those kinds of differences. However, knowing that within that that's true within the nation state, um, the majority of the work is being written in Spain, right? It's being produced in Spain by folks who are in exile or who are in diaspora. Um, and that in Spain, those kinds of ethnic differences are completely flattened out, right? In Spain, they don't care if you're Fang or in the way or Anobones, right? Um, they see you as a black subject, an African in Spain, right? As Michael Garcia argues um, in his book, Africans in Spain. <laughs> um, and so for me, it was really important to be able to be able to be able to hold on to those differences. What does it mean to, to live and to come up in Equatorial Guinea to have a sense of these like ethnic hierarchies and the kinds of systems of oppression within the nation state, but then also to leave and have different senses of solidarity within Spain. The same thing um, on the other side of the Atlantic, thinking through uh, Latinx Caribbean, particularly Black Afro-Latinx Caribbean experiences, particularly around formations of race and racialization, thinking about mestizaje as this, this very long-standing ideologic, uh, ideological and, um, and cultural project, right? That says, you know, it doesn't matter, we don't see color, it doesn't matter if you are, you know, Black or white, we're all Puerto Rican, we're all Cuban, it doesn't matter, we're all one, one people. At the same time that you have um, both over and covert forms of racism that run rampant from, you know, um, thinking about people's uh, uh, phenotype, um, hair and features, to um, the kinds of access to education, to jobs, schooling, thinking about prisons, etc. And the ways that um, all of those experiences get um, erased through a, a refusal to engage um, in racial discourses, right? So the discourse of racial democracy then completely lies the anti-Black racism that pervades, right? Um, these nation states and these nations. Um, and then thinking about what happens when <laughs> these folks go into the diaspora, when they migrate. What happens when you're coming from um, a culture which understands mestizaje um, as like the framework for understanding race and ethnicity to then coming to the United States where hypo descent, the one drop rule, becomes the kind of reigning ideology. And how do we negotiate those things? How is it that, you know, you can get read differently in different places? And I can talk about that later on. But basically that is what this cartography was about. Really me trying not to statically hold these people and say, well, you're black and you're black from my perspective, right? But really trying to to hold on to those differences in, um, and to render them visible, right? As I'm doing the analysis. Um, another important framework for my book has been decolonial feminisms, and particularly thinking about, again, relations across difference. Decolonial feminisms have sought to think through and beyond the ways that colonial hierarchies of the human seek to, quote, fragment people's categorically, end quote, and instead find ways to engage within difference and to find what Maria Lugones calls possible companions in resistance. What does it mean for us to find companions in resistance? And then Laura Perez, a uh, Chicana feminist, argues that a decolonizing politic must introduce, engage, must introduce, engage, and circulate previously unseen, marginalized, and stigmatized notions of spirituality, philosophy, gender, sexuality, art, or any other category of knowledge and existence. And for me, being attuned to decolonial feminisms, to the kinds of ways that the project must introduce, engage, and circulate these unseen, um, marginalized, often ignored, right? forms and ways of knowing and being in the world became really important for me. Likewise, I'm Jackie Alexanders, who is like Faith. Um, uh, her, her position on becoming a woman of color and in, in Pedagogues of Crossing, um, when she talks about this bridge called My Back um, and goes through this kind of entire process of, of basically, basically giving us and offering us a guideline for thinking about women of color politics, not the kind of wishy-washy women of color politics we're all women of color, et cetera, but the kind of like radical women of color politics and vision that was emerging in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, where women of color decided that it would be, um, it, that it was imperative for them to learn each other's history, to know one another, and to figure out where their struggles interlo interlinked and interlocked. She argues in Pedagogies of Crossing that we're not born women of color, we become women of color. In order to become women of color, we, we would need to become fluent in each other's histories and to resist and unlearn the impulse to claim first oppression, most devastating oppression, one of a kind oppression, defying comparison oppression. We would have to unlearn an impulse that allows mythologies about each other to replace knowing about one another. We would need to cultivate a way of knowing in which we direct our social, cultural, 
psychic and spiritually marked attention on each other. We cannot afford to cease yearning for each other's company. And so for me, this has, is not only just kind of um, a beautiful idea, but a real guide for like, what are the kind of ethical imperatives we have as folks who are, yes, scholars, but also humans in the world? Well, what is our relationship with other folks? And particularly, what does our feminism do, right? Um, and for me, relationality is where I open the book. I, I kind of kind of dig into thinking about relationality out of Caribbean co context, out of women of color feminist context, Text, thinking about it through like ethnic studies, comparativity and relationality and that kind of um, tense and, and, and often um, vexed relationship um, and thinking about how can I um, put these folks in relation to, in relation to one another, Equito-Guineanos and Afro-Latinx Caribeños um, in a way that is ethical, but also in a way that potentially could be a model um, for thinking about relationality, not only as um, a hermeneutic practice, but as a lived politic. And Audre Lorde argues um, that the future of our earth may depend upon the ability of all women to identify and develop new definitions of power and new patterns of relating across difference. We have no patterns for relating across our human differences as equals. And I would argue that this is part of the colonial difference that makes differences into hierarchies, right? And because of this, we stand to be fractured from one another and ourselves. The project of relations for Audre Lorde is a lifetime pursuit. It's not easy, right? Um, it is a project that women of color feminists have kept alive as a politics and a praxis. It is a methodology of complex coalition building, of learning each other's histories, of understanding why different fragments communities in search of liberation. And here I cite Chandra Mohanty, where uh, she argues, it is not the color or sex that constructs the grounds for these struggles. Rather, it is the way we think about race, class, gender, the political links we choose to make among and between struggles. Right. And so for me, it was really important to in this text to take the kind of theoretical, poetic, literary um, and personal work of women of color from across the diaspora, particularly from from the Caribbean, particularly black women, and to use those as my frameworks, as my guide to think through and with the literature from Guinea Equatorial and from the afro latinx Caribbean diaspora, right? Um, to, to kind of see the links between the struggles. And for me, it was really incredible that as I was reading the books, I could see um, like this kind of palimpsest of history um, through the literature, but I could also see the ways in which the preoccupations that were emerging from one place were speaking to the preoccupations of another. And so each of the chapters I link, um, the literature is, um, every chapter has some text from Equatorial Guinea, and then a cluster of text coming from the Latinx Caribbean. And one thing that I that I bring forward in the book is this concept of faithful witnessing, which is um, a feminist philosophical concept that appears um, in Maria Lugones' Peregrinajes, uh, Pilgrimages, uh, theorizing, mm, uh, theorizing Multiple Coalitions Against Oppression. I believe the title of the book is, I don't know why I had to say the whole thing, but um, so in that book at the very beginning, she kind of talks about faithful witnessing for like a paragraph. And it's a concept that really stuck with me and it really kind of helped me dive into kind of the ways that feminist philosophy um, speaks not only against, but away from the kinds of normative continental philosophical understandings of being and knowing in the world, right? Particularly this concept, thinking away from Hegelian notions of recognition, particularly agonistic recognition, um, and thinking of other ways, faithful witnessing as a practice that has been enacted since time immemorial, right? Um, by communities um, that have been faced um, with myriad forms of oppression, colonialism, et cetera. And so um, one of the reasons, I'll talk a little bit about faithful witnessing later again, but one of the reasons I wanted to bring it in now is because in the book itself, I talk about faithful witnessing as it appears in the text. But as I wrote the entire book, I wanted to keep faithful witnessing with me as a particular kind of political practice. And so I argue that faithful witnessing is a political act that aligns itself within feminist and decolonial epistemologies and is a method of collaborating with those who are silenced. Faithful witnessing is a feminist philosophical approach that is likewise a strategy through which oppressed people form coalitions in order to combat multiple and systemic oppressions. Faithful witnessing challenges singular narratives or dominant perspectives, and in doing so, takes subjects away from singular interpretations of truth, knowledge, and rights. Instead, it moves subjects towards polysensical approaches, one which understands that there are many worlds and sees many perspectives, particularly the perspectives of those who are dehumanized or rendered invisible. Faithful witnessing privileges the perspective and cosmologies and insights of peoples on the underside of coloniality and ongoing settler colonialism. 
Um, and so for me, faithful witnessing is not just kind of this one chapter in the book, not just kind of like a hermeneutic practice, but a kind of political imperative, right? Um, and an ethical imperative uh, that I feel is so important in any kind of decolonizing politics. Can we bear witness, right? To the kinds of experiences, struggles, triumphs, um, traumas, um, successes of others, right? Um, and how do we do that in a way that is generous and ethical? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the book since I talked to you a little bit about relationality and how I came to the book and the kind of geographies and the cartographies that I'm contending with. And I'm just gonna do kind of like a rundown of how I get through the chapters. Um, and I'll be almost done after that. <laughs> um, so the book opens up with relations and the first main chapter is intimacies. In that chapter, I take up three texts two from the Equator Ghanaian tradition, one written by an Anabonese writer, one by a Sang writer, and then I take up um, a novel by a Dominican writer. These three novels, um, I, I chose these three novels together to kind of think about the coloniality, um, the intimacies of coloniality, right? To really think about the ways that ongoing forms of colonialism, neocolonialism, and the, and the remnants of colonial administrations, right, are able to impact the very the intimate lives of people um, in ways that seem uh, that are seem that seem distant. So on the one hand, I'm interested in the ways that these texts explode what we can think about intimacy, um, and how, for example, a dictatorship that is you know the, one of the novels that is from Anabon is from that island that I showed you that's so 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 far away, farthest away from the seat of power, right? And yet, and still, the decisions that are made in that island and that seat of, po of power affect what these folks in Annabon can eat, what they can wear, will they have soap, do they have clean water, right? Um, if they lease out the kind of waters around, and part of the premise of the book is that the dictator has been leased out the waters around Annabon, and it's a kind of a uh, fish, fishing economy, um, to these kind of large, you know, uh, corporations who then like kind of just suck up their fish, and so these fishermen um, who are, 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 are living through the subsistence economy of fishing and then no longer have fish um, to bring home to the community and the kind of rampant impacts of that. Um, one of the novels that I take up in this chapter is also the first LGBTQ novel of the Equatorial Ghanaian tradition. And there's also the first novel to ever be translated by a, like a woman's novel to be translated into English. There's only a handful of, of novels from Equatorial Ghanaian translated into English from Spanish and they're all by male authors, right? Um, so this is the first woman author, the first queer, queer woman, <laughs> woman period, but also happens to be like, an amazing like lesbian activist, uh, organizer and teacher um, wrote a novel, La Bastarda, which really talks about what she caught, what Julieta Paredes, and I follow Cersus Mendez's work on Julieta Paredes, um, where she talks about the doble entronque, the double juncture of like colonial patriarchy and then like indigenous patriarchy, right? Within the African context and the ways in which um, to be a lesbian is an impossibility, so much so that there's no word in the Fang language for being a lesbian. And so the premise of the book, which is titled La Bastarda, talks about the kind of um, the kind of impossibility of the subject position, the impossibility of women have, being able to engage in particular kinds of erotic freedom um, uh, in corporeal consciousness, um, and the kind of quest to find liberation beyond the kind of conscripts of this double juncture of patriarchy and, uh, and uh, uh, conscripted uh, heterosexuality. Um, and in the third novel, it, it's uh, Song of the Water Saints. It takes place in the Dominican Republic and it goes through uh, you know, four generations of Afro-Dominican women. And really one of the ways that I focus on this book is looking at the ways that the US occupation of the Dominican Republic um, has a particular kind of personal and intimate impact in the life of the protagonist as well as her, her, her children and imagine who, might, who else, right? Um, and in the ways that um, these power structures uh, sought to kind of um, uh, frame her life in a particular way and the ways in which she enacted a particular kind of erotic freedom um, to get beyond the kind of limited existence that was set out for peasant black women in the Dominican Republic. And one of the interesting things is that none of these stories, right? Particularly thinking about Anabon, about, you know, La Bastarda, thinking about Song of the Water Saints, none of them have these happy endings, right? In fact, folks have to run away into the forest and create communities. Um, uh, the kind of woman who finds herself wanting particular kinds of erotic freedom on the island of Anabon gets killed in a collective kind of um, fight in the community. And then the other woman dies eyes of syphilis, right? Um, but one of the things for me that is really interesting is to think not only about intimacy 
um, in the kind of colonial setting, but thinking about intimacy in the, not even post-colonial, right? In the kind of ongoing forms of, of colonialism and coloniality, but then thinking through the ways that women find um, their, what Jessica Marie Johnson calls, you know, this quest for black femme freedom, right? Um, this quest for erotic autonomy, up and against systems that would have them limit their lives, right? And so for me, this opening chapter was a way to kind of explode the book itself and to say like, look, this chapter is on intimacy. This is all the things that are going on. Like if you look at the literature of Victoria Guinea, there's this is happening and that is happening. And there's like critiques of like the fishing economy and the dictatorship and occupation and like, you know, questions about LGBTQIA folks in, in the Guinea Equatorial and all this other stuff. If this is happening, if all of this, if we can pick up these books and read read about things that are so important in our contemporary moment that we can actually like, scale them and we can follow the thread to our lives. Who is seeing this? Who is reading, who is reading these books and taking them seriously and, and using them as ways to further our imagination for liberation? And so that's where I get into the chapter on witnessing where I take up two books, Jonathan Dongo's Las Tinieblas de tu Memoria Negra or Shadows of Your Black Memory and Juno Diaz's The Brief One is Life of Oscar Wilde where I follow both the kind of um, juridical uh, forms of witnessing as well as the kind of religious forms of witnessing as two examples of the way that these texts act as witnesses of both colonization, the act of colonization, Spanish colonization in Guinea Equatorial, and of ongoing um, gender violence um, and the coloniality of gender in the Dominican Republic and the diaspora. And in that chapter, I, you know, I kind of trace the ways that these texts act as witnesses while also not being innocent themselves of these forms of violence. And I argue that if witnessing is such an important part of you know, projects of decolonization, then one of the first things that we need to bear witness to is destierro. And destierro is then the, the next chapter, which is my meditation on exile and diaspora. I found that the word exile and the, the word diaspora were not enough to hold um, the kinds of physical and metaphysical feelings and lived experiences of being dislocated or torn away from your homeland. So destierro is a Spanish, one of the Spanish terms for exile. It's kind of untranslatable in English. In, in Spanish, exile is exilio, but this other word destierro, it means to be literally torn away from the earth, right? Um, and so for me, one of the ways that I wanted to like build and think about uh, destierro through this kind of like decolonial um, lens um, it was important for me to like offer a different way for us to think about diaspora um, and one in which we were able to bear witness to overlapping histories of dispossession. So for me, Destierro is a kind of precondition to colonial modernity um, and capitalism as it develops in the long 16th century. Um, it is, uh, you know, contingent on tearing away peoples from their lands, their land based practices and their languages. Destierro is um, a, 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 a pressing a material and existential phenomenon, one in which the descendants of Afro and indigenous people must um, uh, bear witness to and live and survive each day. But the Sierra is not only these like horrible um, and traumatic things, it is also a form of resistance, right? It is also for me, the Sierra is only useful in as much as we can see the ways that people have from <laughs> the very beginning of the colonial project fought against it, right? Fought against it um, and saved and continued to engage um, in resistance practices, um, in, in rematriation practices. Um, and so for me, the project of the Sierra is important, um, but it only works if we're able to see one another, other desterrados, other folks, right? In relation to our own staying away from land. And one of the ways that I think about this is me as a black Puerto Rican woman, a colonial subject that has US citizenship that is very much a second or third class citizenship, right? Um, and yet and still, I am a colonial subject on the settled lands of indigenous people. How do we contend with these multiple forms of dispossession? How do we see one another across what can seem like incommensurable divides, right? How do we align ourselves with each other's struggles and engage in solidarity practices rather than trying to claim most oppression, right? Like um, death defying oppression, right? And this leads me into the next chapter, which is a meditation on reparations. If this Tierra is the condition that we are contending with in our moment, what does reparations look like? And for me, it was important to, to kind of turn a little bit in this conversation to think about reparations and not only think about reparations in monetary terms. And I wanna be really clear, which is I do believe that we need monetary reparations. Like someone needs to run black and indigenous people their coins, 
like right away, right, right now, right? But I also believe that the kind of positivist model that would kind of calculate um, intergenerational trauma, intergenerational dispossession, uh, attempts at genocide, et cetera, into a calculable amount of money um, does not actually get us to a real repair, right? And so in this chapter, I take up um, some texts um, from Guinea Equatorial, from Puerto Rico, and from the Dominican Republic. And I talk about the ways that each of these texts imagines and reimagines reparations in ways that are partially contingent on funds, but mostly not, right? Really thinking about um, reparations and relationships with one another and what I call a reparation of the imagination. What do, what could our futures look like with one another, right? Um, and so in thinking about reparations of, of the imagination, thinking about how do we um, contend with the violences that have been inflicted in our communities um, for multiple generations and how do we rethink what our futures could look like in relationship to one another, um, I move on to thinking about futurities and what do, at, what do futurities look like in equito Ghanaian and Afro-Latinx Caribbean context, right? What do they look like? And so in the chapter Apocalypse, um, I take up, you know, it's kind of split in two. The first part, um, things through Santeria, ritual practice, Lukumi, um, through uh, a study of the music of Ibei, um, as well as um, a study of a young adult novel by Daniel Jose Older called Shadow Shaper. And then the second part of the novel, um, I look at the kind of apocalyptic ends of worlds imaginings coming from a short story by Diaz called Monstro and a novel by a uh, Ecuadorian writer called Panga um, And so in this chapter, I, I use the framework of Michelle Cliff, a Jamaican writer who has who has now passed away, Michelle Cliff, may she rest in power. Um, and in her essay, In My Heart, A Darkness, where she talks about um, you know, the experience of being a light-skinned you know, Jamaican woman and the ways in which she is seen and interpolated in the world and what she gets to be privy to, right? The conversations of between other white folks talking bad about black people. And she reveals herself to be black, to be Jamaican. And all of a sudden she says, you know, when the other appears to be the one apocalypse right? It is the end of their world. They not only have to bear witness to the foundational violence. That, sh that creates the possibility for Michelle Cliff to be a very, you know, light-skinned Jamaican woman, but then they also have shown their true selves to her, right? And then all of a sudden their facade ends. And so for me, it's really interesting to think through, for example, Lukumi, Afro-Cuban Santeria, and to really take up that kind of um, equation of, of apocalypse, and to think about the ways that practices like Lukumi and other ritual practices that, again, tie us to land, um, into histories, um, going back to the, the chapter in the Cierro, um, become a, an apocalyptic ending to colonial notions of time and space, temporality and spatiality, by bringing the ancestors into our present, by bringing the ancestors into the future, by singing, by reciting their names, by singing them songs, are ways for us to fracture um, colonial logics, right? Um, and become ways that people can empower themselves um, in ways that go beyond of what is supposedly allowable um, within the modern world system, right? On the other side, the apocalypse um, becomes this really incredible moment where there's a very, uh, very uh, wrapped attention to ecology, to the sea, to the animals, to the, to the, to the natural environment, right? Um, and the ways in which late capitalism, right, is um, surely, <laughs> surely and steadily destroying the natural environment and what that looks like. And so in the imaginings of these places, these mines and colonized places become the locus for the end of worlds, not just, you know, a, a kind of apocalyptic for themselves, but looking at the apocalypse for, for the colonial centers, for Europe, for other folks, right? Um, and in each one of these texts throughout the throughout this last chapter, it became so interesting to me that black women and girls became like the linchpin right? They became the center, the only place where we can um, find a possibility of liberation, right? Um, it's through the imagination, the thinking, and the actions of these, of these Black girls. Um, and I end the, the book with the meditation on the sea, which is where I look at the cover image for the book, which is Maria Magdalena Campos Fonz's De Las Dos Aguas. Um, I also take up um, Araceli Germay's The Black Maria um, and the poetry of, of Raquel Ilombe del Pozo Epita. And I look at the ways that the sea appears in each one of the texts, in each one of the chapters, and also the ways that those three works at the very end take up each of the themes um, that I talk about in the book. And I end the book with thinking through the sea and thinking through relations again, right? What does it mean to be in relation? And at the very end of the book, I talk about the experience that I had 
um, bringing writers from Guinea Equatorial to Puerto Rico for Festival de la Palabra. Um, to have them, you know, this kind of connection that I thought when I was in Equatorial Guinea, when I was, you know, meeting with them and interviewing them in, in Spain, and then have them come to Puerto Rico to present their work to this huge festival, um, and then to take them to the rainforest, um, and for them to say like, oh, this reminds me of home, right? This reminds me of my home. And for me, that meditation on relations, again, was so important to kind of end the book with thinking like, you know, these relations are not just imagined. These are historical relations. They are like material relations. They're poetic relations. Um, and then also in doing this project of relations, I'm able to bring some of these writers here and then they feel a relation to the place, um, to the Caribbean. And that way really suturing together what is seen as like this distant cartography of the Afro-Atlantic, right? Um, this imagination. And so one of the last things I wanted to say is that, you know, what propels me through the book and one of the things that I thought about as I was writing the book was the question of decolonial love. And these are my definitions of decolonial love. I build the kind of on them over and over. I don't think there's just one way to think about it. Um, and so I argue that decolonial love as future work envisaged through our past is necessarily a technology for social transformation as Chalas Sandoval argues, and as a method through which we can reimagine human being as praxis. Decolonial love manifests as attention to 1492, to the past before it, the past since, and the subterranean roots created by it and the dead beneath the sea. It can be imagined as looking into the vast and inconsolable sea to make visible what was disappeared and to make perceptible futurities beyond colonization. And one of the things that I wanted to tell you about relationality, and I'll end with this slide here, Archive of Disappearances, because the students that are in the seminar will have read like a short essay on this, is that as I told you, you know, at the very beginning, I had I had this intention about doing a project on Puerto Rico, um, and then I ended on this like kind of expansive Afro-Atlantic project. And it is now, you know, years later that I'm turning back to the project on Puerto Rico. And so this project, Archive of Disappearances, um, is one that looks at Puerto Rican kind of history, particularly looking to the archive from the 19th century to the present. Um, it is a deeply personal project where I take up my own family history um, in uh, in Puerto Rico and. I'm able to trace both through the archives, through ethnographies, or actually through interviews, um, and through photography, um, some of these histories also putting it together with really important projects such as Frank Espada's The Puerto Rican Diaspora Project, as well as films like Didi Tomas's The World of Didi Tomas, um, films by Gordon Parks, um, a film called Delivered Vacant about the arsons in Hoboken, New Jersey, um, as well as Living Los Sures. Um, um, and so for me, it becomes a project in which we can see both the disappearance and the excess of Black Puerto Ricans in the colonial archives, um, and then also turn to material culture, photography, and film projects, um, and, and oral histories, right, um, to show us um, where Black Puerto Ricans appear and reappear for us in the contemporary moment. Um, and so in this way, the project brings me back to the kind of original um, preoccupations and the original kind of heart work that I had as a you know 20 something year old now in this moment. So I want to thank you all for staying with me. Um, and I'm here to answer any questions that hopefully I stayed on time because I can't see my 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 clock. So thanks.